Segunda y tercera llamada. Segunda y tercera llamada, sí. <risa> ok, era por motivos de conexión de internet. ¿Estamos al aire? Gracias. Pues muy buenos días a todos. Eh, es, un, es un agrado tenerlos a todos ustedes el día de hoy eh, presentes para esta exposición magistral eh, a cargo de la arqueóloga Pilar Luna de Reguerena y el doctor Jim Chatters. Eh, como todos sabemos, bueno, la, la arqueóloga Pilar es eso, el pilar de la arqueología subacuática de este país, la pionera, eh, y bueno, eh, vaya, tardaría muchos, muchos minutos en hablar de su currículum, pero todos la conocemos y es la directora del proyecto Yo Negro, del, de lo cual nos van a platicar el día de hoy, y el doctor Jim Chatters, que es el investigador principal de, de este proyecto Yo Negro, que considero es eh, uno de los proyectos más significativos, más especiales y más profesionales que tiene, eh, me atrevería a decir, no solo la Subdirección de Arqueología Subacuática, sino todo el Instituto Nacional de Antropología e Historia, porque ha logrado reunir a una serie de especialistas sumamente profesionales, cada uno en su campo y siempre, bueno, bajo la dirección de la arqueóloga Pilar. Y bueno, sin más preámbulo, los dejo con, con Pilar y con Jim. Gracias, Elena. Muchas gracias, buenos días. Eh, yo voy a tomar unos cuantos minutos y después la presentación la va a hacer el doctor Chatters. Eh, mi primer agradecimiento es el Instituto Nacional de Antropología e Historia, que es a través de este instituto que todos hacemos esfuerzos eh, y grandes esfuerzos por lograr cumplir con los objetivos de proteger, de investigar, de conservar y de difundir todo lo relativo al patrimonio cultural subacuático. Y desde el área de la Coordinación Nacional de Museos y Exposiciones es que se está realizando este cuarto Congreso Internacional de Patrimonio Cultural y Nuevas Tecnologías. A ellos, a sus organizadores, en especial a Mariana Zamora, les agradecemos el esfuerzo por tenernos aquí. Después, estaba yo pensando anoche que rara vez tenemos la oportunidad de agradecer en vivo y a todo color a mucha gente que está relacionada con nuestros proyectos y que difícilmente aparecen. Y hoy tengo la suerte de poder agradecer a muchos colegas y lo quiero hacer de manera particular. En primer lugar está Elena, que es codirectora de este proyecto también, está la restauradora Diana Arano y todo su equipo, que han hecho un trabajo extraordinario, aceptaron el reto de restaurar, de conservar a Naya, que es la figura principal del proyecto Yo Negro, eh, que precisamente se llama Naya en recuerdo de las Náyades de la mitología griega, que eran las deidades encargadas de la protección de las aguas dulces y tenían que cuidar que esos estanques no se secaran. Entonces, le va muy bien el nombre de Naya, a todo lo que va a hablar ahorita el doctor Chatters, que todos conocemos como Jim. Otro, otro grupo que quiero agradecer es a María Fernanda López y a Gilberto García, del Laboratorio de, de Documentación y Análisis Tridimensional, que también han, han cooperado con el proyecto. Quiero agradecer sobre todo y de manera muy particular a los que siempre están allá atrás, que es el grupo de, de, la, de la Dirección de Difusión del INA, especialmente la Subdirección Medios INA TV. Es notable cómo la licenciada Ana Galicia y Gibran, el camarógrafo Gibran, Gibran Huerta, siempre están con nosotros, aunque estén hasta el tope de trabajo cuando Arqueología Subacuática les pide algo, siempre están dispuestos y aquí están hoy con nosotros. Eh, en este proyecto eh, hemos hecho un trabajo muy interesante, donde el doctor Chávez estaba a punto de retirarse y el doc doctor Dominique Rizolo, a quien le agradezco también mucho, porque por él este proyecto llegó al instituto y cuando llegó a nuestras manos fue que creamos el proyecto arqueológico subacuático Yo Negro Tulum Quintana Roo. El doctor Dominique Rizolo atrapó al doctor James Chatters, que estaba a punto de retirarse, eh, presentándole justamente una imagen de Naya en un congreso internacional. 
y desde entonces no solo no se ha retirado, sino que yo creo que trabaja mucho más que en los últimos años. Él está aquí eh, como el investigador principal, título que se ganó de manera natural, como se ganan los títulos, no de jefe, no de coordinador, sino por el liderazgo, por la capacidad que ha mostrado de sus múltiples talentos y disciplinas. Él escribe por lo menos en cinco áreas de investigación. El doctor Chatters ha ido trayendo al proyecto a investigadores de primer orden en el mundo, como el doctor Blaine Schubert, que está ahorita justamente en nuestra temporada de campo, eh, cerca de Tulum, Quintana Roo, eh, que es experto en osos, eh, paleontólogo muy reconocido, o al doctor Mac Greg, eh, McDonald, que, que acaba de escribir sobre un perezoso, primero en género y en especie, y en fin, él ha ido atrayendo al proyecto a los científicos de primer orden en el mundo. Esto ha enriquecido de una manera fantástica el proyecto. Por el otro lado, tenemos el grupo de espeleobusos que tomaron cursos de entrenamiento para el registro arqueológico y que si bien tres son los que están de base en el proyecto, se han ido sumando algunos cuando, cuando es necesario. El grupo que está básicamente en campo dos o tres veces al año es un núcleo de alrededor de 10 personas más o menos, pero detrás de nosotros hay hasta 150 personas que de una manera u otra, pero todos de manera generosa, todos están contribuyendo a este proyecto. La semana pasada estuvimos en la universidad para hacer unas microtomografías de algunos de los restos socios de Naya y le preguntaba a una de las personas al doctor Chatters, ¿cuánto costaría este proyecto si realmente tuviéramos que pagar por todo? Y la, la respuesta fue millones de dólares. Y la verdad es que lo estamos haciendo con un presupuesto muy bajo, gracias a la generosidad, a la generosidad que todos tienen. Por ejemplo, el doctor Vit Petrovic, que por ahí debe andar también, llegó anoche para presentar hoy y se va mañana a Estados Unidos. Él hoy en la tarde a las 4 presenta la parte tecnológica que soporta el proyecto que es de investigación, porque coincidimos con el doctor Nieto, lo fundamental y lo que no va a cambiar nunca es la base de la, del, del objetivo de la investigación, que son las preguntas científicas que se debe hacer el arqueólogo que dirige el proyecto y que pueden ser mucho más ampliadas dependiendo el talento y la capacidad de ese, de ese mismo director y las líneas de investigación que va incorporando en el proyecto. Y la parte sustantiva de la tecnología que está soportando el proyecto, esa va a seguir cambiando. Hoy en día son las nuevas tecnologías y créame que yo ya no soy nueva y sigo viendo más tecnologías y voy a seguir viendo más tecnologías. No quiero tomar más minutos, quiero de verdad agradecer de todo corazón a toda la gente que nos ayuda. Quiero, quiero decirles dos cositas más para terminar. Una, que la vida me regala en las postrimerías de mi carrera un proyecto que es la cereza del pastel, en la que tampoco soy especialista, porque al final del día no soy especialista de nada, pero este es un proyecto que me cae, que es un reto y es un privilegio, pero que lo tomo como eso, como un regalo de la vida para, para cerrar mi carrera. Y por último, quiero darles una gran noticia, hace alrededor de 15 días, eh, nos, bueno, primero nos nominaron al doctor Chatters y a mí por el proyecto Yo Negro, para, para el foro arqueológico de Shanghai y hace como 10 días nos avisaron que, bueno, que estaba muy reñido, que nosotros estábamos entre los primeros lugares del, del galardón de premio por el descubrimiento en campo y finalmente hace unos 10 días nos dijeron que habíamos ganado el galardón, entonces el doctor Chatters o yo o los dos tendríamos que estar en China hoy, pero no podemos, tenemos este compromiso y tenemos nuestro trabajo de campo, pero nuestro director de arqueología subacuática, el doctor Roberto Junco, que iba a estar en esa región del mundo en estos días, le pedimos que alargar unos días para que él presente el proyecto en Shanghai y reciba el reconocimiento que lo, que lo tomamos a nombre de todos, porque este proyecto lo hacemos todos. Muchísimas gracias y le doy la palabra al doctor Chatters. Um, 
mi español es, uh, no es suficiente para hablar rápidamente. Uh, uh, sí, especialmente temprano en la mañana. Uh, por lo tanto, ¿sí? uh, mi transparencias son en español, yo hablo en inglés. Es posible para... Um, uh, answer. Contestar preguntas en español, pero no para <laughs> presentar en español. Um, this is not necessary for most of you, because you know where you are. You're in the Yucatan Peninsula, and uh, this is a slide. Part of the reason I don't have all this written in Spanish so I can be reading it to you is because we were awarded this honor in Shanghai that Pilar just mentioned. Um, but part of accepting the award required writing a presentation to be given there and writing a script for Roberto Junco to read there. None of that was expected, and we got word of that just a week and a half ago. So, my apologies for this being in English, but I'm uh, not learning as fast as I'd like in Spanish. As you know, the Yucatan is known worldwide for its spectacular architecture of the Maya. It's everywhere. This is, just happens to be Ed's now, which is close to, close to here. Um, but it is beginning to reveal evidence of much earlier occupation uh, underground. We're not finding any pre-ceramic sites. I don't know of any reported pre-ceramic sites, in, uh, in, especially in Quintana Roo, but in Quintana Roo, but in, in the Yucatan of Mexico in general. But we are beginning to see things underground. No artifacts yet, no real sites yet, but we're finding evidence of human activity in the presence of the humans themselves. Now, the divers have been working in the area for now more than 30 years, and they have mapped as much as 1,500, 1,500 kilometers of underwater caves, the largest cave systems in the world. And occasionally, actually not infrequently, they find bones of huge animals in the water. They find manatees, they find uh, gomphotheres such as this one. Um, they find you know, saltwater fishes sometimes, but they find many different skeletons underwater, including among those skeletons are humans. Most of the humans are Maya, but as many as nine are considered to be pre-ceramic skeletons. And one of these is the Chan Hole skeleton that you see here, which was unfortunately moved by someone and cannot be found. Um, but one of them is also Oyo Negro, and that's what we're talking about today. Oyo Negro was discovered in 2007 by a team that calls themselves the Proyecto Espeleológico de Tulum. And that's uh, Alex Alvarez, Franco Atalini, and Beto Nava. Alex and, Frank and, and Beto still work with us. Unfortunately, Franco lives in Sweden, so he's not available to dive with us. But they were mapping, working at mapping the Outland cave system. It's part of the Sistema Sakaktun, which is the second largest and may by now be the largest underwater cave system uh, known in the world. This is the map of Outland Cave. Perhaps we can turn that light off. Is there a way to... That every time I turn that direction, it's blinding me, so I can't see what's on the screen. I can turn it back on when it's... Oh, I see, that's for the filming, isn't it? But the film will... Hebron, you'll pick this up a little better with, without that. Yeah, the, they're mapping the Outland Cave. These, ma these maps are amazing. They're just tr tremendously detailed with a compass and a, and a tape measure. But this is the Outland Cave. At the confluence, at the cross, where these tunnels meet, they found this immense chamber. 
And as they passed over it, their dive lights disappeared into darkness. And so they named it the black hole or Oyo Negro. That's what Oyo Negro looks like. <laughs> but when you, they're using a, a method called painting with light, about a 30 second exposure on the camera, you can get a better sense of what Oyo Negro is like. It's just this immense, it's the size of a football pitch. That, that's world football, not United States football. Okay, a really big field. Uh, it's a bell-shaped chamber, as you can see in the plan and profile, Plante Perfil here. Um, it's an immense chamber and consequently it's a large inescapable trap. It's 60 meters in diameter, approximately 62 at this point in our measurements, and between 28 and 40 meters in depth from the rim of the tunnel that enters it. So it's, it's a very, very large. If you're falling in, you are not getting out. If you're falling in, you're dying on, a, on impact. So this is what it looks like from the bottom. The, uh, uh, the tunnel that you were looking from before is in the center, at the top center there. But you get a sense of the extremely large uh, area that this is. The divers have been finding bones of numerous animals in both the tunnels and in the bottom of the chamber. This is a, a mylodont sloth we'll be investigating next week, but they're finding them in the tunnels. Also in the tunnels, they recently in May found tracks of an extinct bear on the floor of the tunnel. Numerous tracks of an extinct bear. Uh, mind you, this is a bear the limbs of which, the leg bones of which, had never been found before anywhere in the world. I mean, it's a South American bear. And now we even have the tracks of the bear. We've also got its legs. Um, bones are scattered along the walls of Oyo Negro because there was a pit, a, a pool of water, a small, una, una laguna, <laughs> in, uh, in El Piso. And there's hanging, this is an arm, Un, un, un brazo de un perezoso grande de Shasta. And on the floor of the cave, there are other animals. This is another, un, un otro perezoso grande, uh, que llama uh, Nohochi Chakshi Balbaca in the Maya. And a human. And this is what we're talking about because this is an archaeological meeting not a paleontological one, this is, we're talking about Naya. Naya and bones of the extinct animal are found together on the floor of this cave. Here's Naya. Here's her skull and her umaru. And here's the pelvis of the gonfathir. The bones of Naya and the gonfathir are mixed together. And some of the what was very exciting initially was that some of Naya's bones lay underneath some of the gonfathir bones. The bones of the gonfathir weren't lying directly on the human, but they were lying in that position. This is the first time in the Western Hemisphere that we have seen human bones and large animal bones together in, in one location, large extinct animals in one location. This is what drew me in, into this project when they, when they invited me to take part. We also have evidence of past environmental changes, including changes in sea level. We have bat, what called bathtub rings, or what do we call it in Spanish? Ano, uh, anillos de banderas. Um, all the way up the walls of the cave are these bathtub rings that show previous sea levels. Also on the floor of the cave, this is a composite view of a portion of the cave floor. These white areas, blanco, Conos blancos are conos de calcita. They're calcite raft deposits that have information about past water levels and past water conditions. And these are being studied by our team from McMaster University. There are two PhDs already completed on this work. We also, on the bottom of the cave, oh, I'm sorry, they can't see some of these, Apilas de Guano de Murcielago. 
carbón y madera. Um, y um, es posible uh, con ellos um, reconstruir en uh, medio ambiente de este lugar. Okay. The team. Pilar mentioned um, who the team was, uh, was in included, but we have team includes people from universities in three, in three countries, uh, United States, Mexico, Canada, primarily Mexico actually, Mexico, Canada, United States in proper order. Uh, and we're working increasingly with members from UNAM and UADI. So we're, we're getting more and more, this is becoming more and more a Mexican project and less and less a, a project of, of other, other groups. Now, what we're trying to do in this project are recover or identify and recover specimens of uh, the different species that are found in the cave, radiometrically date them, determine their age by whatever means possible, uh, analyze stable isotopes of carbon, str strontium, nitrogen, and oxygen in their bones and their teeth to determine their place in the ecosystem um, and where they and their movements around the landscape. Strontium is very good for that. We're, we're trying to extract ancient DNA. So far we've only gotten it from the human, from Naya. Um, the human bioarchaeology, paleohydrology, paleoecology, paleoclimatology, and paleo this and that. Okay. There are many technical problems that attend this project. And since that's the, what this conference is about, I'm going to focus on, on those aspects of it. The technical problems we confront are a consequence of the environment we're working in. We're in a very deep, dark cave. Uh, that deep, dark cave environment requires specialized training for people to be able to work there. Pilar, I'm going to bring you over here. I'll sit here. People can't read. Some, I see folks trying to read down there, so I'll move. Yeah, I'll just move up here. Um, being small, I don't like these between me and the audience, but uh, we'll deal with it this way. Um, but it's, it's t specialized training. It's years of training, and um, I'm a little old for becoming a cave diver that can dive to 160 feet, or what is that, 65 meters depth. The, the, the specimens are very delicate. Uh, we're finding out how delicate some of them are in our collection efforts. And diagenesis of the bone in, in the cave environment has affected the methods, analytical methods that we're capable of using and so we're having to develop new ones. The problem with the environment of the cave is it requires um, specialized training that the scientific team in general does not have. We have two, two cave divers among our scientists. Um, the two geochemists that work with us are cave divers, but the rest of us are just beginning to become good divers. Therefore, the scientific team cannot participate directly in the collection, or the, the finding, documenting, or collecting of samples and specimens. We have to rely on the divers to do that. We're using creative techno technological solutions to solve that problem. So we can't be there physically, but we can be there in, in other ways. So we're being there virtually. The search of the cave uh, was the initial action that was taken. Uh, the divers uh, located and photographed, they found and, and photographed little groupings of bones, mostly large bones, because when you're uh, searching an area the size of a football pitch, you <laughs> are going to see the big things first. You're not going to see the small animals. They took photographs, and then we worked with the photographs. I spent weeks and weeks looking over these, these complex photographs to identify uh, the animals we were working with. But these were flat, still photographs. You can't to identify a bone, you need to be able to turn it around, look at it, and, and, and uh, see it from all sides. And you can't do that with a, with a flat photograph. But what we've been able to determine from the photos so far and from additional work is that we have at least 13 species of large animal in the cave. 
Seven of those 13 are extinct animals, which tells me we're missing somebody here. That's six and six. Who have I left off? Cuvironius tropicalis is not there. Oops. Okay. I'll have to tell Roberto that and we'll add him on there. But it's a large collection. And one of these animals is, is a completely new species, a species of, uh, of giant ground sloth. Nohochi chukchi babaka. I, get, I love to say that name. Um, and we have two species that have never before been documented north of Venezuela. At least two. We're, fi we're collecting some others this trip, and we might find more that have never been seen north of Venezuela. And here we go to the, the high tech. The search and documentation is been, being greatly aided by a process of detailed photography and 3D modeling by structure from motion modeling. You're going to see more about this this afternoon when, when Vid Petrovich uh, does his presentation. We're going to, he's asked us to work with him. We're going to sit and we're going to explore Oyo Negro. You're going to be able to actually explore with us and you will be able to guide the activities that, that we do this afternoon. You know, take us in places that you want to see and thus experience what it is that we're doing. To make that model, they have swum, they've put in a grid system, lines across the cave, and taken a photograph every 1.5 meters all across the cave. We have hundreds and hundreds of photographs, and they've been stitched together to make a, a complex, large map of the floor, photo of the floor, and model of the floor, but also for areas where we're going to be studying individual finds, we have smaller scale models produced of, uh, of those locations in higher resolution. This is the composite photograph of the floor, a part of the floor. If it was the whole floor, it would be so small it wouldn't be easy to see very much of it. I've given you part of it. The black dots, hey. I make it easier for you to see somehow. There. Maybe you can still see me in there. Now you can see the screen a little better. The black dots are um, guano de, de murciélagos, bat guano piles. The white spots are calcite raft sediment. We're using that model, the three dimensional model, to um, in study and recovery of specimens. And I'm going to show you how that was done with Naya, who we've already collected from the site. First thing we do, we're going to, we're going to swim in a little bit. This is what the model looks like. Uh, that round area in the center is the floor of Oyo Negro. To the right and above is the tunnel that enters, the east tunnel, and the direction most of the animals probably entered by. We're going to come closer. And we're looking at an area down here in the center in the location where Naya was found. We're going to come closer still. And our attention will be to the, uh, we're, we're working on recovering the legs in this project you and I are engaging in right now. So we're, we're coming in closer to that area in the top center here, which is Naya's legs and pelvis, the pelvic group. Ephemera. And if we're in the model truly, we can actually rotate this and look under and around things and find out what problems we may have in recovery. But one of the problems we have, of course, is knowing how big the bones are and how big a box to bring out, bring them out in. Naya's bones are very delicate, and consequently, we needed to bring her out in a way that did not disturb the bones unduly. We wanted to know how big it was, so we lay a grid across it, and then we measure its length. And this particular femur, because it did not have its distal end, was 37.56 centimeters long. So in designing the box for recovering the skeleton, we can use that measurement to know how big a place to put in the box, how big a, a, a hollow to have for the box. This is a plastic skeleton of the same size as Naya that I got from a medical supplier. 
in the position in the box, and we use this for training the divers b before recovery, and also it's, it's used to make sure that the recovery spaces are co correctly conformed. Um, here I am working with Bito Nava, our lead diver, on how to handle each of the bones right before. We talk about this on the surface and we talk about right at the water's edge because when you're diving that deep, your brain doesn't work all that well in doing creative things. It needs to be doing rote things you've already practiced. So he's looking, we're looking at the femur and how the femur is to be handled when it goes in, where it goes in the box. Each place in the box is numbered to receive a particular bone. That number corresponds to the number in the dive card at right. So he's, um, everything is specified as to exactly where things are going to go. Here they have the bones picked up and put in the box in their proper positions, and they're about to close it and seal it off. That box is not, to be op not going to be opened until it reaches the laboratory. The reason for that is we want no air to enter, because if air gets in, the water can move back and forth, and water acts as a hammer smashing against the bone back and forth going over those very rough jungle roads. So we want no water, no air to get in. If you don't have any air in it, the water just sort of sits there and goes like this. It moves almost nothing at all. Once we got to uh, Campeche here at the Hospital General de Especialidades, um, we did another high-tech thing and we CT scanned the bones before opening the boxes. In order to have a record of the bones, a three-dimensional record of the bones in case something cat catastrophic happened, the bones were damaged in, in opening or they fell apart upon contact with the air. So we have a complete record of, of everything we collected before we even see it physically. Then we went through and triaged the bones opened the boxes, triaged the bones to find out what problems there might be that we had to deal with right away. We took samples off the bone. As you can see here, Diana and I are working. There's, there's white sediment here that we collected, and Diana is now going to be working on that, doing chemical studies of that sediment as part of her uh, study of the diagenesis, of the taphonomy of, of Naya. They went into desalinization, which uh, occurred over a period of about two months. That's about right, I think, two months. Uh, and uh, here's Naya. This is the most complete human skeleton from older than 12,000 years in the Americas. It is the only female we have older than 9,000 years with a complete leg or a complete half of the pelvis, the oscoxy, this. That's your first complete leg of a female, of a woman, that's your first <laughs> complete pelvis of a female. So now we know body proportions, we know limb proportions, and we know a good deal about her uh, um, life, her reproductive life. The analysis of Naya has included chronology, ancient DNA analysis, stable isotope analysis focusing on carbon and strontium. We'd like to work with nitrogen too if we could possibly get some protein out of these bones. Extensive osteological study, including dental anthropology. And then doing a little play, we've done facial reconstruction. Uh, when I, in this, the asterisks, those mark areas where high technology is being applied. Radiocarbon dating is the standard of archaeological dating, and it's very problematic in the caves of Quintana Roo. Um, usually we don't have collagen, organic materials that cannot be established as collagen but may be found in the bones are not reliable, and I'll explain why. Carbon Charcoal is not reliable as a source of dating for minimum age or maximum age simply because it floats. Charcoal may dry out, it may be refloated by the next time the, the water floods the cave and be redistributed, and we see evidence of that extensively. And finally, bioappetite, which makes up the mineral portion of the bone, 
may be contaminated by carp dead carbon from the water. And Diana is finding strong evidence that that was going on with, uh, with bone, not necessarily with teeth, but with bone. Now, usually, we don't have collagen. We've su succeeded actually once. Um, we have tried to extract collagen from the bones of five animals. Uh, and uh, I, I say see an exito here, but actually without full success, we did get collagen out of one of our extinct bears. Um, but generally, collagen is present at less than 2% of modern normal, which is not providing enough for us to do radiocarbon dating of it. It may ultimately provide us enough to do stable isotopes of nitrogen from it, so that's what I'm hoping for next. But it's a very serious problem, so we have to use alternatives. Organic material isn't reliable because, as you can see here, the dates of remipedes and isopods, these are animals we caught alive, took back to the laboratory, dried out, and radiocarbon dated. The remipedes were 800 and almost 1,600 years old, and the isopod, which was down on the bottom of the cave around the bat guano piles, dated almost 4,700 years old. The food chain, the base of the food chain is ancient, and it, the base of the food chain is probably including bat guano that's deposited 10,000 years ago. So whenever you have somebody saying, well, I use dated organic material from these bones, but they don't specify that it's, that it's collagen or it's not collagen, you cannot rely upon it. Okay. Charcoal is not reliable, and here's why. We dated charcoal from... from uh, multiple bat guano piles, but uh, we're, we have it from, from two bat guano piles, rather. And if you see the radiocarbon dates in black on the bat guano seeds from the bat guano, these are fruit bats. And of charcoal from the same position on the pile, right at the very surface, the top of the pile, the charcoal has been 3, to 9, 300 to 900 years older than the seeds. Charcoal no es confiable para fechamiento. Okay, bioappetite is possibly contaminated by ancient carbon. You're getting older as you go to the right in this graph. Um, the freshwater above, Arriba, is um, approximately 1,600 years old, even though it's now. Uh, the uh, water, the, the salt water, is on the order of 12 to 14,000 years old. So we do have the potential for contamination with ancient carbon. The solution with NIO was to date, date the, um, the enamel, tooth enamel, plus some additional things. We have two radiocarbon dates on the, on the enamel from the third molar um, from two separate laboratories using different pretreatment methods, and the dates came out within 15 years of each other, which is really, the probability is that's the real age. Um, contamination should give you divergent ages, not similar ages. And the, the, the Average age then is between 12,900 and 12,700 years ago. That makes for the oldest human skeleton yet found in the Americas, but we're not sure because of that ancient carbon problem. So we've done Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, or FTIR. I can't believe I could say that this morning. But um, this is a comparison done by, by Isabel Cesar at, uh, at UNAM and read. The red line is Naya, the blue line is a modern human tooth enamel, and the peaks and the form of the peaks are identical. And there are no additional peaks anywhere along that flat line off to the left over here that would indicate contamination by any other species of, of molecule, which indicates that the result is reliable. The analysis of of Naya's bone, however, shows very distinct separate peaks uh, indicating uh, that there's uh, a problem. So we have also um, looked at this in another way, and I'll, I'll point that out here in a little while. We confirmed the age with uranium thorium dating because there are calcite formations that have developed on top of Naya's bones, and you can see them, these, these little bush-shaped structures here and here. We call them florets, Flo florets, florets. Um, 
and they date more than 12,000 years. So Naya died more than 12,000 years ago for sure. This is the strategy that we have for the whole site. We try to get collagen. If we have collagen, success, great. We've got the age. We're in good shape. We have the gold standard. Without collagen, we date materials that are on top of the bone, wood, seeds, guano. Again, I don't trust charcoal, but seeds uh, and guano to def determine maximum age. We can also date calcite formations that are present on a lot of the bones or calcite infilling in the, the cavities of the bones. And we'll use that for the minimum age, and that work will be done, done by Juan Pablo Bernal at uh, Unam Queretaro. So we get the minimum age that way. And then the maximum age can be gotten by cleaned bioappetite, because we know that carbon contamination is making things older than they truly are in the bone. So we'll either we'll use um, enamel esmalte if possible, because that's more reliable, but if not, we will use the bone itself. And so for Nohochi Chakshi Balbaka, the new species of giant ground sloth, the minimum age is from wood that was laying on top of the mandible. That's 11,400 to 11,600 years. And the maximum age is the date, that the first date we have on the bioappetite of the tooth they don't have enamel in their teeth, ground sloths don't, so it's more um, uh, a dense uh, dentine, but it's around the order of 34,000 years. So it's a big window, but at least it's a window. We're trying to make it smaller. Okay, Technolo technological analysis um, for osteology includes a lot of pieces. So we're measuring stable isotopes. That work has, some of that work has been done at, uh, at UNAM in Mexico City. Some of it's being done by others. Um, work, and again, that's a high technology. I'm not gonna talk more about that. Uh, the investigation of pathology and trauma, investigation of uh, patterns of growth, and uh, means of getting access to skeletal parts to, to study them without actually touching them because they're so fragile, even though we've got paraloid in them, they're very, very fragile still. Um, so we're creating secondary forms to manipulate and to make copies for exhibit. We're using, again, high technology for all of these aspects. We've done extensive radiography and tomography of, and, and com computed tomography of, of Naya's bones to develop full models of every single specimen to create a record that then can be used by others. So we have x-rays for dental analysis, x-rays in the hospital here in Campeche uh, for other studies and microtomography in, in uh, two universities here in Mexico. Here's one of the examples of what we get about information about health and about taphonomy. This arrow, and we're a little, little bright in here, but that hollow, that's caries, it's a carie. Uh, we're looking at dental caries, but also look at the darkness here. This dark area is less dense. This is the area that's undergoing dent di diagenesis. So it's probably undergoing a uh, solid state transformation of, of the cal calcium carbonate portion, or the parts of the calcium phosphate is being replaced by calcium carbonate out of the water. So if we want to date it, date anything, we want to date an area that does not show any signs of that kind of change, and up in here is the best place to look. So that's one thing we're learning. We're also seeing evidence of trauma, and we're able to study details of the trauma with the micro, to part, to, uh, micro CT. But uh, this is a spiral fracture of Naya's left forearm. She was abused when she was younger. And we have evidence, evidence of food supply, her, her feeding patterns, her nutrition in, um, the micro, in the CT scanning. To the left is a CT scan of Naya. To the right is that of a um, healthy, modern human of about the same age. And look at the many lines. These are called Harris lines. They are 
intervals of growth interruption and then rapid regrowth. This tells us about the way Naya lived her life. The blue arrows on the right show you the periodic lines, the ones that are spaced evenly look like once a year. There's a period of starvation, of protein starvation once a year. And then in between, you can't see them very well here, I'm sorry to say, but um, there are intervening lines marked by the red arrows that are um, sort of sporadic or episodic events of protein deficiency. These tell us three things. First of all, Naya was not living off the marine environment. If she did, she would have had protein year-round. And second, um, her population was probably new to the landscape. They had not adapted yet to be able to deal with this protein deficiency that was clearly happening every year. And even during the good times, they didn't always have ready access to protein. They were not always successful getting it. So they're adapt I'm gonna, that's all I'm going to say because there's a paper in review and I can't go through talking about its contents. But um, it's very important. This is, this is the best piece we got out of Naya right here. Okay. Then for studying and reconstructing Naya, we can make 3D models from the CT scans or from... Um, 3D uh, laser scanning, which you're going to hear in the next presentation. And we are then able to print copies. Either we can have 3D digital copies that people can then study anywhere in the world, or we make copies, print copies that can be used for various purposes like display, or, or in this case, I'll show you the... <laughs> the uh, reconstruction. But this is Naya's skull printed from a 3D model produced by Structure from Motion Photography. It's really quite accurate. We've gone through the reconstruction process, which is the, the low-tech part of our reconstruction effort. And this is what Naya, more or less what Naya looked like. From the bone, we can get everything right down to the slant of her eye opening, because it's related to certain markings on the bone. But that's approximately what Naya looked like. Very wide set eyes, short, not very wide face. What we know about Naya so far, because you'll want to know that, is that she died between 12,007 and 12,900 years ago. She, as I've been saying, is female. She was 15 to 17 years old. She had been a mother. She had given birth at least one time. We are absolutely certain of that. Her people were terrestrial foragers. They were not marine-oriented foragers. There was frequent protein deficiency. She was not particularly tall, although she was average for her time, uh, and extremely slender. Muy, 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 muy delgada. I don't know what the Enya is doing down there in the corner. It just got lost, I guess. And her people were extremely mobile in what was probably an open environment, not a closed jungle like it is now. What we're doing right now is recovering more specimens. We expect to recover parts of 10 animals. I think when I left, we had recovered parts of four already. Um, and we're going to be reco recovering some stalagmites and other pieces of speleothem uh, for doing paleoclimatological and sea level change reconstructions. And that work is ongoing and uh, very exciting. So this fellow here, the, the fool on the hill, the, uh, he sits and watches this, uh, this saber-toothed skull, hangs over the side of the cliff cave and has been watching for probably several tens of thousands of years, um, he is now with us and uh, we'll know who he is and a lot more about his life. So, preguntas. Gracias.
Buenos, buenos días. ¿Sí me escuchan? Está prendido. Eh, buenos días. Yo no soy arqueóloga, así que como una persona que hasta hace muy poco conoció a Naya, somos parte del equipo que hicimos los interactivos para el museo y nos tocó hacer la ilustración de Naya. Retomamos el cráneo, le pusimos cabello eh, y utilizamos la imagen de una compañera de trabajo muy delgadita, le sacamos fotografías y fuimos quitándole músculo, músculo, músculo y cada vez que pasábamos una imagen decían es más delgadita, es más delgadita. Y fue fascinante porque los diseñadores y los ilustradores empezaron a sí mismos, por sí mismos a buscar información de dónde venía. Entonces, más que una pregunta, es un agradecimiento para, entonces, eh, para los no arqueólogos, pues es como un privilegio poder saber esto y ojalá poderlo comunicar al resto de la gente y que lo entienda de esta manera tan clara y tan divertida además. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias. Qué bonito que nos compartas esa experiencia. Gracias. Y justamente eh, estamos también aquí en Campeche porque va a ser la inauguración del Museo Arqueológico Subacuático, donde están trabajando todos ustedes y una de las finalidades más importantes del trabajo de una investigación científica es darla a conocer al público, ¿sí? es para la generación actual y las futuras. Entonces, la divulgación científica es fundamental, así que muchas gracias por el trabajo y por el comentario. Eh, ¿Tendremos alguna pregunta por la red? Correcto, muy bien, pues… Eh. Ok, a ver… ¿No? No, gracias. Correcto. Bueno, pues muchas gracias, Pilar. Gracias, Jim. Gracias. gracias.